Welcome to the Vogus Prospecting Patron account where I answer patrons' questions. If you'd like your own question answered, simply sign up to the Patron account for Vogus Prospecting, leave your question under the pinned comment, and I will make a video just like this one. Today, the question comes from Rebecca Graham, and it's all about high bankers. Right, Rebecca's question, I'm gonna read that out off my screen. Would love to see this... English. We'd love to see a video discussing, discussing, discussing your modifications for your high bankers. We got our 10 inch out back the other day and would love uh, the, or like the, oh my God, my English. Woo, I got Ross River brain. Come on, we can do this. Let's start again. We'd love to see a video discussing your modifications to your high bankers. We got our 10 inch out back the other day and would like options on matting, angles, modifications, wash bars, loops, and what you find works best and what are the errors you have experienced and seen. We are at Slady Creek and while a while ago there was oil residue all over the top of the water in sections. What do you do to reduce your impact on the environment when you're out, etc.? That is a fantastic question. I'm gonna try and summarize in the best way possible. I spent a whole bunch of money on this high banker. Now I got it for a pretty good deal um, and I did that for a few different reasons is that it basically ticked all the boxes for what I needed in a high banker, which is processing power, which is all to do with the hopper, recovery, which is to do with the length and um, I should just reiterate, the processing power also has to do with the width of the sluice. So processing power is width and hopper size, capture rate is length. There is certainly a place for small high bankers, small cleanup sluices, and there's definitely a place for big ones. You have to find a high banker when we're talking about units like this that suits your physical needs. The biggest problem you're gonna find is energy and time. If it takes you 40 minutes to set this up, so getting it out of the car, getting all your gear to your location, including the pumps and the hoses, fitting it all together, getting all the angles set correctly, getting the water flow set correctly, and it takes you that 30, 40 minutes to do that, you've just lost 30, 40 minutes of sluicing time, whereas a small high banker that runs off, say, a battery pack, you can take to the creek and set up in 10 minutes, and it's a lot less weight and a lot less... Uh, physical energy needed to do that. So the first thing that you should consider with any high banker is how big it is and if it's a big high banker, do you have the energy to warrant setting that thing up to then process dirt? Because you might spend so much energy on setting this up that you only get an hour or two's processing, which kind of makes its power redundant because you're not going to be able to utilize it for as long. So you might as well just bring a small high banker out that you can use all day. Therefore, theoretically, shifting more dirt in the long run. Right. When it comes to matting, you have a heap of options. This is a drop riffle system that's from Goldhog. It's a rubber mat, but it's a drop riffle system. This is a vortex system that you have from Gold Rat. In behind here, we've got a mixture of stuff. Now, I can't pull all this out, but down there, you can see some expanded mesh sitting on top of miner's moss. And if we look over here in my big high banker, we're using grass, fake grass that you would buy from a hardware shop, so AstroTurf. I like all of them for different applications. I personally found drop riffle sluices to be probably the least efficient at catching gold. If it was up to me, I would only use a drop riffle sluice for cleanups because you can fine tune them, you can, you can adjust your feed rate, you won't make mistakes like you will out in the field. It's guaranteed that you're gonna make mistakes in the field. It's something to bear in mind. So they're easiest to stuff up. Vortex matting works really well, but only if your soil is clean. And what I mean by that is no big clay balls. And if there are clay balls, you want a spray bar system that's gonna break them up. And I'll get to that in a second. So vortex matting works best on um, mountain till. So the sort of gravel that, that might have some thick consistency, it might kind of clump together, but it doesn't stick together in a big hard ball. It needs to be loose so that when the dirt hits the run, the, the vortexes have a chance to actually suck 
the material out of the dirt. They have the chance to suck the gold out of the dirt. And therefore, they don't work in all situations. Where they do work, they work exceptionally well. The last one is the expanded mesh, and then what I've got in the big high banker, which is a series of, um, oh my god, Broth River Brain. <laughs> uh, Const I think they're Constantine Riffles. I'm going to go with that. I could be very wrong. My brain is not functioning so well with this virus. Anyway, Expanded Mesh is the most universal. It just offers a really high amount of friction and it's very hard to stuff up. If you run it too steep, if you run it too flat with in terms of your uh, pitch on your bed, it's still going to catch a high percentage of the gold. It tends to even trap clay balls so that if you do have a little bit of clay and whatnot running down your run and it's got like a chunk of gold in it, it can settle out. Not always, but it can, unlike the vortex matting, which won't do that. So, expanded mesh is my personal favorite for the all round. And the last one are these riffles down here, which I've been very surprised about. Besides my brain completely failing me on what these are called <laughs> at this very second, these riffles here are fantastic when they're set up like this. So there's, there's three different types. These are the most extreme. So we've got basically an L shape here. And I was just mentioning something. A lot of people think that these cause vortexes so that when a piece of material like gold drops in over the top, that it's going to get sucked in underneath those riffles. You can see that a little bit better up here where it's open. So it comes up and over and they think it drops down and gets sucked back in. But that's not true. This is literally just dead water here. There's no suction coming back what you're relying on is that when the material drops in over the top it hits that eddy and then it has a chance to sink down into your matting system so the grass or the miner's moss or whatever it might be uh, in a drop riffle system you won't have this here it'll just be like a crevice that you're hoping that your gold is going to drop down into now i was a bit dubious about this for many many years these systems but what we've found is that when you mix this with expanded mesh, it works okay, but when it, when they're on their own with just a matting system, they seem to work even better, don't they, Fern? Yeah. <laughs> so we've had really good success with this. I've now done four sessions with this high banker, and when we do our tailings tests, we're finding with those riffles that we're losing about... 2%, which is pretty good. A 98% recovery is excellent. You're always going to lose gold no matter what matting system you put in your high banker. It really depends on how fast you feed it compared to the capacity of your machine. This is 12 inches wide, and I don't even know how long. It's long. It's very, very long. So that means that I can feed a lot of dirt through this because the dirt has a lot of space to spread out across this run. And the, the hopper up here is designed to wash the rocks efficiently. When it comes to washing rocks, it comes down to your spray bar setup. These spray bars here crisscross. So this shoots water all the way over into that corner and this shoots water all the way over into that corner. And that means that when the dirt goes through this, there is no chance for it to go through dry. It's literally going through a sheet of water. Some people like to have spray bars that shoot back up the box and they work really well, especially if you have like a fan of water and not just jets. Regardless of how your spray bars are set up, the main idea is very simple. You want resonance time. You want the dirt to be in contact with the water for as long as possible because that frees up all the dirt off the big rocks. It breaks apart clay balls and it allows everything to become loose and individual. And therefore, if you have a big sheet of water shooting back up your box, you're going to create like a big vortex at the back and that's going to wash your rocks properly. Same goes for that, except it's just coming in from the sides doesn't matter as long as your dirt stays in contact with it for as long as it possibly can. Some of the worst boxes that you can get, uh, they look like this. This box down here is a box from Goldhog. Now this is a cleanup sluice, so it's not 
the same, but some high bankers are built like this. The water comes out of this chute here, and it just runs directly down this sluice box here. It's a pushing motion, not like a tumbling or a washing motion. And that pushing motion doesn't clean rocks. You don't want a pushing motion in your sluice. So if your header box just has water that comes out of the top and goes down the hopper and then down your run, that's bad. You always want something that's spraying or, or covering the inside of your box, not just running along the bottom. That's the best way I can describe it. When it comes to things like angles, it's manufacturers are going to give you a tolerance range, right? Start there. So you get on the literature and they'll be like, oh, start at six degrees. Don't take that as a hard and fast rule. Just take it as, okay, I'll start at six degrees and see what happens. When it comes to it, I set it up very simply. I just put it on an angle. It doesn't matter. I get it level and I use the water running out the end of the sluice to get it level. So if you've got a big sheet of water coming off one direction, you level it out until it's not doing that. And once you've got a clean sheet of water across your run, you know that your sluice is probably pretty close to level. When it comes to angle and pitch, I use the gravel to tell me if I'm too steep or not. I try to set mine up at around nine degrees at most, most times. It seems to be where I land when I do check it. But if you've got your sluice too steep, what you're gonna see is the biggest rocks that fit through your classifier bar will scream down the run and fall off the end. They won't pause, they won't slow down, they won't stop. If you've got your sluice box too shallow, those big rocks will stop at the very top of the run and not move. You want them somewhere in between. You want them to lazily roll down your run. So the biggest rocks that fit through your classification bar, you want them to just meander down your run. If they're doing that, it means that they're going to self-clear out of your sluice box, but they're not going to be going so fast that indicates that when there's a small piece of gold going down your run, that it's going to fly out the end. That's what you don't want. So just use the gravel. That's what I use. Now, sometimes the angle might not be the problem. You might have too much or too little water. So you want about one or so centimeters, half an inch worth of water running over the top of your riffles. If you have that, you probably don't have too much and you probably don't have too little and you've given yourself just a little bit of space to make an adjustment if you need to. So say you think you've got the angle right, but the rocks still aren't moving correctly, then you can up your water or vice versa. As for your pollution question, when it comes to pumps, it's very, very simple. Keep them maintained. There are seals and, and things all around drain plugs and, and in the actual body of the engine. Look after your pump. That's the first thing, so it doesn't leak anywhere. And the second thing is refuel it away from the creek. I fuel my pumps normally at the car before I take them down. Because at the end of the day, that saves me carrying a jerry can in. And if I have to go back three hours later to get more petrol, then I can simply make that trip when I go and have lunch. And that stops any spills happening in the creek. They're the two main things that are going to happen and cause your oil slicks. Leaky, crappy pumps that people just abuse and don't look after. And people refueling on the creek, which is not what you're meant to be doing. It's not always possible, but when you dig with a high banker, you will create a big hole, a crater in the ground. In the creek bed itself, it's probably not that big of a deal because the very next flood, it's going to get filled in. But if your tailings piles are up on the bank, push your tailings back into the creek. Because at the end of the day, that big lump of rock on the side of the bank that you've now created is not good. It's not natural. It shouldn't be there. And it takes literally two minutes to get the end of your pick or your shovel and just push it back down into it. If you're digging a hole up on the bank, somewhere that the public can access, somewhere that's going to cause erosion when the next flood comes through, Again, push your tailings back into it. At the very minimum, your coarse tailings. I know that often the, the fine tailings will travel, they'll spread out. They, they, they're not in a large clump that's easy to shift and move. So you, that's not always possible to put the fine tailings back in. But the large tailings, it's almost certainly possible to put them back in the hole. And what that's going to do is prevent that bank from eroding further. It's going to prevent people having accidents by falling into them because it does happen. I mean, a lot of people say that, oh, if you're going to fall into a high bank hole, you're, you're an idiot and you're not paying attention. 
But how many of us have been walking in the bush and accidentally stuck our foot in a hole? Like it happens all the time. So just backfill your holes where you can. That's part of your responsibility with a miner's right um, here in Victoria and pretty much across uh, Australia, as well as much of the rest of the world. It takes two minutes and you should be doing it. Well, there you go, Rebecca. I hope that does answer some of the questions you might have had, and I hope that helps some of the other people out in prospecting land with the questions they may have around high bankers. If you have any follow-up questions for this, please let me know, because I think it's a, it's a very interesting subject, and I blitzed through it. There was a lot there that I sort of skipped over, uh, because this video would be four hours long otherwise. If you've got more questions, let me know. I would love to address some of the more common ones that come up. Until next time, guys, please give your dog a big scratch behind the ears for me. Peace. And I'm going to go prospecting.